All right, so again, greetings, Johannes Wilder Manuel here, Ross Yifdea, Lejifdi, RastafarRenaissance.com, and as promised from so many times before, we will begin our uh, few free and open uh, Hebraic basic lessons here. And again, uh, the um, extent to which we had sought to bring this forward from such a time was because there were so many layers when we actually begin to study the Hebrew. It's not so much as just, um, you know, taking in a few phrases and, you know, learning the writings here or there. I mean, it's just something about the, I mean, one, of course, can do that, you know, and just uh, learn from what they have with what they call the modern Hebrew as of today. But when, you know, you actually really start to study the Hebrew, and especially from a biblical perspective on up until modern day times, you see, you know, how many levels, you know, you actually have to go through to really start to grasp not only the Hebrew language as a whole, but also the history, of course, behind it. And that has definitely been a journey that I most certainly am still enjoying up until this point now and hopefully for, you know, a, a lifetime to come. But I, even so, just, um, you know, a, a few quick, you know, uh, uh, lessons here that will kind of start off to kind of at least walk ones through at least the levels in which we will introduce here because I definitely have looked around to see a lot of what is being presented as far as any Hebraic learning language. Um, I guess you can say uh, uh, renditions or certain uh, uh, linguistical studies. So, and, and again, like I said, for ones who, you know, would rather just learn, you know, the Hebrew quick, fast and easy, you know, there are definitely certain outlets and platforms out here that will allow that. But of course, when you actually come across someone who is very in-depth and very studied within the Hebrew language, especially when we start uh, dealing with, you know, uh, what type of Hebrew are you dealing with? What dialect are you speaking? Or uh, in this sense, um, being able to place a certain uh, level of writing skill, grammar, and uh, so on and so forth within a specific you know time space continuum or being able to place it within a certain age or being able to interpret you know certain phrases here or there or you know other uh, important facts that really go into you know the um, degrees of how one has uh, learned speaks or writes the Hebrew language you know ones will find themselves at a disservice at that point but you know you will be able to converse you know with any you know, modern Hebraic speaker to this day. And I keep mentioning uh, a modern Hebrew in this sense, uh, uh, just to, um, again, allude to, you know, exactly what we will be getting into and how we will be sharing uh, our learning and, uh, you know, much of what we have gathered from any other ones as well up until this point about the Hebrew language. So in uh, a one sense, we definitely would love to start ones off, of course, with uh, introducing what they would know today as the Paleo-Hebrew or the Phoenician Hebraic script. And this is the script which ones would, of course, see a lot of the uh, modern-day Black Hebrew Israelites utilizing, especially on the street corners, so on and so forth. But uh, even in this sense, when ones hear the word Phoenician or the Phoenician Hebrew, the Phoenician script, you really have to take into consideration what is a Phoenician, where a Phoenician comes from, what is it, you know, how is it defined, so on and so forth. And in this sense, Phoenician is purely a Greek um, defining point or, or a Greek phraseology in a way to describe the Hebraic speaking peoples of, you know, the Levant or, or at least the Semitic speaking peoples more definitively of the Levant and what the Levant is uh, usually um, categorized as is the places within Mesopotamia or in that sense of definitely the um, 
fertile crescent, as they would say scientifically and archaically or uh, archaeologically on that sense. So kind of ones can get the gist, you know, of what we are saying. And I personally would take Phoenician out of the lexicon completely because uh, on that sense, you would be, uh, again, speaking Greek, which is a language that uh, doesn't even have its doesn't even have its have its inception until after. Uh, the Hebraic language has developed some eons before up until this point. So, you know, I, I personally, you know, at least especially for a lot of the learning that we will be doing here, especially from its inception up until, you know, we get to a certain level of understanding, you know, I would place Phoenician, you know, completely out of the category on that sense of explaining, you know, at least from, the stream, the streamline of which we will be learning the language on that sense. And uh, again, um, here, so uh, Paleo-Hebrew is more so where we'll be coming from on this sense. Uh, or in that sense, uh, proto uh, sinaitic uh, sometimes used in certain uh, phraseology. That'll be utilized uh, quite a bit. That's one that, um, you know, once we'll be able to kind of remember and be able to place it. And once you actually say it, it usually pops right up in your mind what people usually are talking about. But uh, this uh, particular, um, you know, a script, this writing style, this uh, level of uh, speaking in this sense was indeed utilized not only by the Hebrew peoples, but other Canaanite um, peoples along the Levant, the Fertile Crescent, uh, Mesopotamia, and even on over to uh, the Mediterranean, the Northern Mediterranean, uh, of what ones would know now in that sense. And this is exactly why I would say in this sense of studying Hebrew, ones would take Phoenician out of their lexicon. Why? Because when ones actually start to speak about the Phoenicians, you actually begin to study within history the break that came between Phoenician and Hebrew. So at one point you can see clearly that there was, you know, a parallel line of what would be known as Phoenician or Canaanite and Hebrew. And then all of a sudden, especially during the time of uh, Hannibal and uh, of course the Carthaginians, of course, of North Africa, so on and so forth, you know, there's this split. There's this split of what a Phoenician is and what a Hebrew is or what a Jew, so on and so forth, and Israelite is. You see the break. So this is why, you know, it's um important that we study this uh, particular uh, language, this particular script writing of the language. But indeed, we must be able to make those differentiations and have that discernment. And this... um. You know, particular uh, writing style, this script, this uh, ancient uh, archaeological, uh, linguistical um, speech pattern, uh, usually, uh, especially from a lot of the scholars that we have studied, uh, comes up in the Punic or the Phoenician, as we mentioned before, uh, uh, languages, and stemming from a timeline of around uh, the 12th century BCE or the 10th century BCE on up to the 2nd century AD. So it was still utilized not only by Canaanite peoples, but by Israelite peoples or Hebraic peoples at the least known up until the second century AD. Probably um, many of the uh, prolific scholars would say that uh, the Hebrew peoples or the Israelite peoples probably utilized this script uh, widely especially in their writing and their language and also the speech pattern, so on and so forth, you know, where you would actually go into a community and see this type of writing, you know, throughout the community up until about the time 135 A.D. Some would say 135 C.E. or the Common Era, or the 135 A.D. as in after uh, uh, the death of Christ or Anno Domini. So this is, again, the uh, Phoenician script. Just one uh, little division here, one categorization of the Hebrew. The next would actually be biblical or what they would call classical Hebrew. Now, again, as we mentioned before, uh, the Phoenician, the Punic, or the Paleo-Hebrew in this script 
is actually what we will see amongst the black Hebrew Israelites. And even so, they would love to perform, or at least perform on the street corners and utilize their rhetoric, saying that this, this Paleo Hebrew, this older uh, writing style of Hebrew, is the Lashon Kodesh. More properly, it would be the Lashon Ha Kodesh, as they would say, or even so, from their own pronunciation, they would say the Lashon Ha Kadash on that sense. So, just giving the timeline, and again, as I mentioned before, you know, ones would have to even, you know, fight very fervently to keep Phoenician and even so Punic out of their lexicon when they're actually studying Hebrew. Why? Because the Canaanite peoples and also the Hebraic peoples utilized this script and this language learning system, this writing system at the same time, but there was a split. There was actually a split within uh, the timeline in which this comes up. So we have, again, uh, a biblical Hebrew, which actually had begun to be um, uh, written, of course, and uh, utilized throughout the communities. And uh, we would say, again, uh, on up to the point of 135, AD or 135 CE, the common era, it was still utilized, but you will see, you know, many uh, instances throughout history where, you know, certain peoples of Hebraic or Israelite uh, ancestry would utilize this writing form, and it continued on, you know, even to the writing systems of many of the most uh, prolific um, literature, you know, again, uh, 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 biblical Hebrew and classical Hebrew would still be considered what ones would know as this quote unquote Phoenician, Punic, or Paleo Hebrew style. And this was, of course, drawn from a lot of the, you know, Assyrian languages, a lot of the Akkadian languages, a lot of the Aramaic from what we know today, the Canaanite, as I mentioned before. And even so, uh, are driven on up to the point of uh, what we know now as uh, the Tiberian. And this is where we will mostly focus a lot of our pronunciation, a lot of our, um, you know, again, uh, uh, accreditation in this sense. Why do we uh, focus so much on uh, the Tiberian pronunciation of the Hebrew and even so much as the writing? Is because this is a time where the most prolific of Hebrew Israelite scholars were actually producing works in the Hebrew language. So this is where we actually find uh, uh, the roots, uh, uh, the grounding, uh, uh, the, the foundation of what uh, Hebraic scholarship becomes in this time. And uh, moving forward throughout that timeline period, we come to the third period in which we would call the Mishnaic or Rabbinic period. This period brought on what ones, of course, know today as the Masoretic script of Hebrew. Now, in this sense, when we get to this uh, particular timeline, we focus a lot on Ezra, the prophet Ezra. The prophet Ezra, of course, uh, after returning with many of the Hebrews and uh, even so more uh, the Jews in that sense, so a lot of the Judaic uh, uh, tribe, tribal uh, origins, uh, of course, uh, coming from the Babylonian captivity, but more so a lot of the Hebraic uh, peoples as well. But this is a time, of course, when the inhabitants of Judea were finally, um, of course, uh, taken within that Babylonian captivity around 586 B.C. Uh, uh, after their return, of course, um, you know, even so after the uh, Medo-Persian captivity, you know, ones uh, begin to reconstruct a lot of their writings. And uh, not so much as reconstruct them as if they were to change them in that sense. It was more so to reintroduce and rebuild you know, of course, you know, a broken kingdom at that time. As we mentioned, a, uh, a time in this this space where the Babylonian captivity, you know, there was the time of the kingdom of Israel along with the kingdom of Judea in that time, which were both completely, uh, I, would, I wouldn't say annihilated completely, but there were a lot of, you know, shambles at that time. And the Hebrews, of course, were left with very little to build upon even upon returning in that sense from, you know, their captivity, 
you know, and in this uh, time, exactly when uh, ones like Cyrus the Great, who, of course, allowed, you know, ones like Ezra to return to, you know, their uh, their homelands in that time in the Levant, of course, near the land of Canaan, you know, close to that beachfront property, you know, ones began to reconstruct their Hebrew at that time. And in this time, this is when we get what ones would see now today as the modern Babylonian square Hebrew script, which, of course, they will be seeing now. And in this sense, a lot of ones, um, again, as we mentioned before, from the uh, black Hebrew Israelite camps will utilize the older languages or the older writing uh, uh, scripts, the old older writing systems, and, uh, of course, acknowledge that as the Lashon HaKodesh. But in this sense, coming to the writings of Ezra and the teachings of Nehemiah, so on and so forth, these ones, you know, will come to this point uh, knowing that this particular writing style or this particular script was come to, come to be known as the Lashon Chazal. Now, uh, in this sense of the, the writing, the script, the language, uh, uh, the speech patterns, you know, um, much of the um, vowel pointing was developed in this time. So ones have to remember this as well. The vowel pointing was developed during this specific time. And we would like to say that this uh, came up around the time of uh, 458 uh, B.C. In that sense, dealing with Ezra and Nehemiah, a lot of, um, you know, very interesting writings begin to become developed around this time. And, and again, uh, this is where we usually draw the majority of our pronunciations, our, our speech patterns, because this is the time when the prophets of the of the scripture, the prophets of the Bible begin to really, you know, indulge in a lot of the teaching or the reteaching of the Hebrew spirituality or the, the religion, as one would say today. And in this sense brings a lot of, uh, again, uh, that uh, repetition, you know, hence the word Mishnaic. Uh, Mishnah, of course, from the Hebrew uh, sense means uh, to repeat in that sense, almost uh, in a uh, Deuteronomy type of, uh, or Deuter Deuteronomical, <laughs> as they would say, Deuteronomical uh, sense of uh, uh, repetition. So again, uh, repetition, as they say, is the mother of learning. And this is, uh, again, what the entire Mishnah uh, period, the uh, rabbinic period, and even so the development of the uh, ha Masoretis or the Masoretic text in which we know today was developed. This uh, time period usually uh, is dated from around uh, the 5th century BCE, as I mentioned, around the 400 BCE or so, up until, um, say, around uh, 7th century A.D., or so some, you know, actually, you know, estimated to be somewhere around those lines. So again, uh, uh, again, this is the uh, Mishnah, the Mishnah, uh, the Mishnaic Hebrew or the Lashon uh, Chazal, as they would say, is where we mostly will focus, especially a lot on the writing, because this is uh, a very important time within uh, Hebraic studies where ones, of course, will gain uh, the most to be had. And of course, uh, moving on to the uh, fourth period, uh, this is where uh, I would say uh, uh, a lot of the Hebraic uh, studies and the um, education of many uh, Hebraic peoples and Israelites uh, comes into you know a lot of challenges. It becomes very, very um, uh, perplexing time for ones in that sense, uh, and that's a uh, medieval. The medieval Hebraic or the medieval Hebrew uh, writing systems or scripts, so on and so forth. And this is where, um, you know, much of the Hebrew peoples have found themselves to have fallen out of power in that sense. But they are still very influential in many communities. Uh, say as to say, as I mentioned before, with the uh, Phoenicians and uh, Hannibal in North Africa, so on and so forth, the Hebrews find themselves scattered amongst many peoples, especially in the Mediterranean, on over to the Horn of Africa, Arabia, and even so far as uh, we would say uh, the Near and Far East in that sense. 
And, uh, you know, again, as we mentioned, so many layers to really um, expound upon, and we've uh, gone over so much um, at this point. We wouldn't like to, of course, overwhelm certain ones with what is uh, being said here. But even so, the medieval period uh, definitely brings out uh, a lot of the biblical, uh, Assyrian, Aramaic, and uh, much of the uh, Koine Greek, which had begun to influence much of um, the biblical studies and um, things were uh, developed such as the Tanakh, so on and so forth. So it really became very interesting within the medieval period. And it still usually um, is found to be um, written within the style of the uh, Mishnah or the rabbinic Masoretic style of Hebrew. In that sense, with a few modifications here or there, but utilize this within uh, the 7th century A.D. on up to the 16th century A.D. And it's very, very important that ones keep that as a note. You keep that as a note because in this sense, especially in Islamic Spain, France, and Portugal, uh, amongst that um, group, especially uh, with the Moors, in uh, Europe, who, uh, of course, had taken over from around the time of uh, 711 on up to 1492. Hebrews were almost, in a sense, uh, gaining much credibility and grounds within a lot of these communities, especially. And uh, uh, this is where, you know, I guess you can say a lot of the literature that um, came from the times where uh, many uh, poets, many philosophers, many scientists were being pumped, especially out of many Moorish uh, dynasties, many Moorish kingdoms, and uh, the times where a lot of the Moors, in that sense, now, of course, are able to claim that Hebrews or Jews or Israelites, you know, of course, are Moors in that sense, or in this really, or at least the reality of the sense they were able to pass for Moors, especially within many of the dominions where the Moors, of course, were ruling. So the medieval Hebrew period is definitely an important time to mark on this journey of studying the Hebraic language. But of course, we come to uh, the final and um, I guess you can say, I wouldn't say the most complex because it's actually uh, not that complex at all if ones are actually... Uh, studying in this sense on up to this period and, and have been able to keep up with what we have been saying, especially, you know, from throughout these periods. And again, now I'm marking this fifth period here is the modern day Israeli Hebrew, uh, what they would say modern Hebrew in this day. Some would even say the Ibrit uh, Chadasha in that sense. But um, again, now keeping to the... Um, tradition of the Mishnaic or Rabbinic or Masoretic uh, Hebrew, the modern Hebrew keeps a certain element of the script or the writing in that sense from uh, uh, certain times in ancient uh, periods, from, especially from the Rabbinic period. Uh, the modern Israeli Hebrew was created in the late 19th century, as we are reading here from this uh, particular um, study, of course, which we utilized uh, with our own studies of the language. It was a mixture of Biblical Hebrew, Mishnaic Hebrew, as we mentioned before, also with the influence of Yiddish, which is a German language of certain Jewish Origins now, of course, we would get into much of that, but not to you know hold ones for too long on what we have spoken on so far, and of course, this is speaking to the Khazarian influence, the uh, the Euro Jew, the Euro uh, Jewish influence, and in what we know today. This is the Hebrew that ones can easily pick up and find anywhere uh, in your libraries, you know, or wherever you may be able to. Uh, you know, grab a, a certain, you know, uh, Hebrew learning dictionary, so on and so forth, you know, it usually will be found within this context of the modern Israeli Hebrew context. So uh, continuing on here, uh, their written Hebrew, they simply used 
their literary models, however, with some modifications. As I mentioned before, see, we're still actually using Mishnaic or Rabbinic or um, what all we also call our Masoretic Hebrew script with just a few modifications here. But uh, continuing on, when it comes to the use of tenses and subordination in sentence structure, the influence of Yiddish was predominant. Now, clearly, this is what a lot of black Hebrew Israelites, and even so many just other Hebrew Israelites who are more so just coming into uh, the realization that they are uh, Israelites, especially from scriptural study, historical study, uh, archaeological study, they would, of course, uh, accuse, especially ones uh, of our like, especially amongst the Lion of Judah Society, Rastafari Groundation, uh, myself, and many others as well, that we are mostly speaking from a Yiddish perspective. Now, ones, of course, who know anything about Yiddish would know that that's a complete farce, because Yiddish, in its sense, and in this... um accusation just to say the least if ones are actually accusing us of speaking yiddish from the way we speak hebrew then that clearly is you know a um you know a red flag just to let us know that ones don't even know what yiddish even sounds like because if you actually have a chance to listen listen to one speak the yiddish language as opposed to the hebraic language you will clearly see the differences and you will clearly see you know, that um, the Hebrew that we tend to speak clearly comes from a biblical perspective and so on and so forth. And ones who actually speak Yiddish clearly will have that definitive uh, dialect. They will clearly have that definitive, you know, speech pattern. And, you know, it would definitely, I mean, this is for, you know, anyone who really would study Hebrew on any type of level. It will be clear and cut and dry that ones can actually see the difference between a Yiddish or a German-influenced speaker of Hebrew and a biblical Hebrew speaker. It will become like night and day, but ones, you know, definitely haven't taken the time to actually study that in depth, so clearly they make accusations without any type of proof. So uh, continuing on in this sense, just to um, clear the air on that, it is possible to conclude that the founding speakers of Israeli Hebrew or the modern day Hebrew which is spoken in the state of Israel today were native speakers of Yiddish a language this is one of the major differences between Mishnaic Hebrew ones will see that it says mechanic Hebrew here but it, that's actually Mishnaic that's a, a correction that we actually made here and the modern Israeli Hebrew the new words created for modern Hebrew are strongly influenced by Europeans language mainly German and Russian and this is exactly where we defer on a lot of the pronunciations especially in the Hebrew and uh, again uh, uh, as clear cut and dry here from a study uh, which we will actually have to find again the link to so that ones can actually study this for themselves and uh, of course I uh, verify it uh, we can clearly see the differences between what is known as the modern day Hebrew, which clearly is German, Russian influenced, European influenced German or, or, or European influenced Hebrew, uh, I should say, and biblical Hebrew. And even so with the writings, uh, ones will actually learn that Yiddish itself doesn't actually have a set uh, script. Yiddish is completely developed from the Hebraic script or the uh, Hebrew Aleph Beit, the alphabet, as they would say in these days. But uh, they have, you know, much of the uh, stylized uh, words, much of the um, modern day usages of certain phrases that are clearly German, Russian influenced. And this is what uh, developed into the Yiddish language. So uh, again, you know, keeping all of this in mind while we are getting ready to of course, uh, present a lot of our Hebraic studies. Again, we won't have too many up here for complete, you know, uh, 
uh, steady and uh, completely free because again this takes a lot of energy this takes a lot of uh, time consuming work uh, to put together so ones that really would love to study this a lot more in depth and really gain some understanding on how to speak the biblical language you know they would have to visit us on patreon through our links here where we will go a lot more in depth to a lot more studies and again you know just um, giving ones uh, the tools to be able to continue their learning within this language because it has so many layers within this, um, you know, particular uh, time space continuum. But again, uh, uh, having these five time periods laid out, you can definitely see how the Hebrew uh, developed from ancient times on up to modern day. And even so, uh, even though we laid out these five uh, critical times, we actually uh, have left out archaic Hebrew, or at least what we would classify as archaic Hebrew, as ones, of course, would um, know from their own scriptural studies, especially in the book of Genesis, dealing with Abraham and uh, Joseph and uh, on up into the times, of course, of um, the birth, of course, of the uh, children of Israel in that sense of the children of Jacob. There was this time, uh, of course, in the scripture where ones find that uh, Abraham, Isaac, and of course Jacob, you know, were uh, traversers throughout the land of Egypt. And of course, from scripture, we see that, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were able to converse with many Egyptians. Now, in this sense, there are a lot of questions that need to be raised. And, you know, I would definitely throw this to a lot of black Hebrew, Hebrew Israelite uh, camp followers. You know, I, I know that they don't allow you to ask many questions, you know, as we you know, at least are <laughs> seen and uh, have been able to gather from our own reports, especially from the street corners, that, um, you know, there are uh, not a lot of questions that are, a are able to be asked, especially with. Uh, what's being taught within a lot of the camps in this sense and not to, you know, shoot at a lot of people. But again, you know, if you actually want to learn the languages, then there's a certain level that needs to be presented on this sense. And this is, uh, you know, again, just not to shoot at a lot of the, uh, the black Hebrew Israelite camps as well. This is also to differentiate, you know, many of uh, a lot of the uh, Moorish teachers as well, though I'm um, we had spent uh, quite a deal with uh, a particular group of Moorish scholars. We definitely still have to make those differentiations between Ishmaelite and Israelite on that sense. So uh, a lot of things still come into question. And even so, this archaic, this archaic Hebrew, this archaic form of Hebrew, which, you know, uh, definitely gets overlooked. It definitely uh, hasn't been put out in the sphere of... Um, language learning or in that sense uh, history and archaeology in that sense also uh, ones would have to explain how ones like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were able to converse with said Egyptian rulers, with said Egyptian peoples in that time because clearly we have here from our own scriptures that they were able to speak with certain ones and you know uh, uh, gather themselves especially during certain times of famine or here or there, Abraham, of course, being the first Hebrew, and uh, he being able to traverse throughout the land of Egypt before actually settling in the land of Canaan. And uh, this uh, definitely, you know, presents a uh, credible case, a credible case of um, how uh, the um, proto-Hebrew may have actually been uh, written and spoken in uh, such a time, uh, at the least uh, estimated, around uh, the 12th century BCE and uh, anywhere beyond before that. So uh, we definitely look into this a lot more and a lot more intently as we continue along. But, you know, again, just uh, uh, starting ones off, as uh, we mentioned before, so many layers, so many layers here that need to be uh, explained, uh, need to be uh, studied. And even so, to this day, we are still studying ourselves and gathering much information. So um. Hopefully that will prepare ones at least for a lot of what we intend to present here as far as language learning and linguistics within the Hebrew language. 
and we are, are definitely looking forward to presenting much more as the time passes.